I cannot stand a knife with a lock that's weak. I mean, don't put a lock, you know, who wants anywhere else in life? Do you want a lock that's weak? Are you going to tie, <laughs> are you going to chain your bike up with a lock that's weak? Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 118 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, which is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn everything about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anybody who loves knives. You know when you hear the Knife Junkie podcast that you are in the right place. And Bob, a great guest today. Uh, a repeat guest, but uh, it's been a while, man, since we've yeah. had this guy on. Yeah, that's right. He was on episode 20. We caught up with Andrew Demko, famed for his uh his amazing custom work, the AD10, the AD20, these are, are the AD10 and the AD15. Uh, these are folders. Oops, you just about spoiled it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the AD10 and the AD15 are, are his, uh, his very well known and well loved, uh, custom, uh, custom folders. And from those, uh, and other designs of his, he created the, uh, the triad lock, which is now exclusive on cold steel knives. And it's a back lock. With a with a uh, stop pin in it, and it is generally uh, known as the strongest lock in the business, right? Uh, so Andrew Demko has a has a real thing for designing locks. He also came out with the Scorpion lock, which is a backstrap sort of affair. It's really cool. Uh, everyone pretty much knows it. Well, he has something new out, and we wanted to, uh, to catch up with him and have him on the show to talk about it himself. And uh, it's so cool. And now you know there's another mission for me. So, uh, like you said, uh, after you listen to this episode, you can go back and listen to episode 20. That's at theknifechunky.com slash 20. And uh, hear back-to-back uh, interviews, if you will, from Andrew Demko. So, without any further ado, since he's got some big news to spill, let's get into it. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Last time you were on the Knife Junkie podcast, we talked about the the cold steel release of the 8010 and the 8015, very high fidelity okay. uh, versions of your famed uh, custom knives. And now looking through Instagram and following you closely, I see that you have... Uh, uh, you alluded to something that was in the offing a year ago, and now it's finally out, and it is the – well, tell us about your new innovation. So it's a, another new lock. I call it the shark lock. Um, I think you'll notice when you when you see the knife, the way the uh, unlocking mechanism. Although, you know, there's other knives that unlock like that um, with the fin-looking thing. That's That's really nothing new. But it's an idea that I had – I made my first sample, I think, in – about 2008 or 2010, and um, I worked on it a long time. It's very difficult to make, and uh, at one point I, I kind of got it where I, I made working samples, um, and they were awesome. I still I still have still use knives that are 10 years old, um, and I put it on the back burner because I thought about this the scorpion lock, mm-hmm. and so that was that was actually easier. Although it's it's complex to build the, the knife itself, the 8015. It was actually easier to make that lock. So then I just concentrated on that for a while. And now once I got that all out of my hands and, you know, it's my custom production is flawlessly running. I don't have to pay any attention. My brother runs all that. I just sharpen knives and uh, look at knives and <laughs> he does all the machining. So um, now that that all got, you know, grown up and on its own, I went back to my original shark lock design, mm-hmm. which I didn't know if I wanted to call it that, you know, my... My brother, he's a little critical of me. He was like, I don't know about that name, but I said, that's so cool. It's a cool name, you know? So anyway, it, I I got the idea years and years ago after I did the ram safe lock for cold steel. Well, not really after that, but. The so, ram safe, you know, that, was, that was the lock that got used on the pocket Bushman? That's right. That's the pocket Bushman lock. And Cold Steel asked me, they had they had an old knife. You remember the knife called a Duke Duke? Yes. I think it's a French knife. The French it's knife. Just yeah. A, yeah, folded steel. 
and then a very simple knife with a spring in it. And um, Lynn said to me, hey, can you make something like this that locks? And instantly I said, oh, yeah, I got it. You know, because of the, the horseshoe frame, all you have to do is somehow wedge something in there to impede that, that blade tank from closing. So when you're talking so, about a horseshoe frame, you're saying it's one piece of metal that's folded over and that creates the body of the handle. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's, you have a backspacer already already there. So it was really easy to make a strong, strong knife. Now, that knife, is it's kind of rough to operate. It's got a really stiff spring in the production uh, version. But my customs were pretty cool. And um, so after I learned, you know, I did the triad lock, and then I, and then I did the, the ram safe lock. I was thinking about how I can incorporate the the linear movement that the ram safe lock had, but still in a more of a, a traditional knife, like a triad lock or, you know what I mean, a left side, right side. Mm-hmm. I wasn't folding any steel in half in my shop, other than the stuff I made for cold steel to samples, which was very difficult. And I, I didn't want to get into that. So um, plus you're limited. You know, you're not, you're not putting all kinds of G10 scales on. So the, the real key to a locking mechanism mechanism is that you have a blade you know that's pivots and somehow almost every lock has a fixed point on the frame or someplace usually on a frame and then a piece of something a piece of steel or titanium wedges into that spot mm-hmm. and stops it jams it from from closing even on a like a liner lock you think about it when you open that blade the liner presses the blade tang, you know, moves over, presses the blade tang up against the stop pin. So again, it's pressing the blade against a fixed point. Mm-hmm. And so with the triad lock, the, with the stop pin, the rocker goes down into the blade tang and then it's pressing into the blade tang between the blade and the pin, you know, and likewise with say spider coast compression lock, the liner moves over and it compresses. That's why I call it the compression lock. The liner, I assume, mm-hmm. the liner gets compressed if it were being closed between the stop pin and the blade tang. Axis lock, they use the, the frame and then the pin goes through and the blade tang. So every, every knife lock typically, except for a lock back, a regular lock back does not because, or a scorpion lock because the pin goes in and there's no, it just sits in there and it relies on the tolerance of the other holes for it to be uh, hmm. solid. So anyway, I knew that I could take that triad lock because it had the, the good thing was the stop pin. You know, that really you right. take a, line or, or a lock pack and you had that stop pin and it's already better. So the but stop pin is added between the leaf, the, the spring and the blade itself, and it absorbs a lot of the pressure. Yeah. So just like on a frame lock, because I was when I did the triad lock, I knew that. Um, well, as I studied lockbacks, I knew that they started off pretty good, and then sometimes the rocker would sink in, sink in. And why that is is the there's no angles that really allow for any take up or where they the rocker goes in there, it bottoms out, and then that's it. It's it's gonna it, it might not come out, but it's kind of wobbly. Mm-hmm. And um, so I thought, well, if I can put this stop pin in like a frame lock, because I was putting frame locks and liner locks at the time, that it would. I could somehow make that lock back better. And when I started experimenting with that, I realized how to wedge it in between the blade tang, not just for the stop pin of the blade, but also to get the rocker to hit that too. So the, if you think of the, the new shark lock, it's really the same principle as the triad lock, but instead of the locking mechanism moving up and down, basically, even though it, it, it pivots, but it's up and down, it lifts right. up. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, the, this shark lock now is the exact same principle, but it's moving in and out or, or mm-hmm. laterally yeah. like the, like the ram safe lock did. So with the success of the ram safe lock, and it was a, it's a strong knife. It's a strong lock. I knew that, well, at the time I knew that I could put a pin in on top of that ram safe lock. And instead of, uh, the ram, the locking members, we call that the ram. Mm-hmm. And so the ram, Watching against the blade tang in the in the bent frame, there could be a stop pin there, and then it could wedge between the tang and the stop pin. So that's what I was. This is clear back in two thousand eight or two thousand ten. Hmm. I was kind of working on that stuff. So describe. Okay, we're we're talking about the uh, shark lock. It's the your new patented lock. I saw your your patent actually yes. come back from the uh, department of the U.S. Uh, patent department. Uh, I saw it on that Instagram picture. Very cool to see. 
this new shark lock is featured on your new custom knife, the AD20. Describe to listeners who maybe haven't seen the Instagram pictures yet or haven't seen it at all yet, what they're, what they would be looking at that's different from, from your other knives. And then, um, describe how that lateral motion that you're talking about fits into what they're seeing from the outside of the knife. So you'll, you'll notice when you see that the area that would be the lock back or the back of the knife where your thumb would rest, you'll see that, uh, the, the shark fin type of area that you pull back like you would release an axis lock where you, you pull those pins, you're on the side of the knife straight back. So it's kind of, it acts like a thumb ramp kind of. You can put your thumb on there when you're using it, uh, but then when you pull it back with your thumb, that inside is moving. Uh, it's There's a wedge. It's, clearly, it's a wedged part, but it's a, a lot going on there. It's a wedge, but it's it also allows the lock to move back and upward, which is kind of the key to making that really good because I, I first of all, I, I had it like a fork. So it just was that I was talking about moving that wedge between the tang and the pin. Mm-hmm. And I was moving, I had the fork that was the wedge. And then on the top of the fork was the thumb release and it was opened. And then sometimes I would unlock them. So I had the, you know, I had the I'm talking with my hands, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. I can't stop. So I would unlock it sometimes too hard. And then it would, I would totally come out of the knife and, and then oh. the spring would, um, it would shoot because I instead of having a totally enclosed locking mechanism, I had this fork feature with an eighth inch pin and a compression spring around the pin like a strut, uh, you know, with a spring around a, a cylinder, mm-hmm. and it would shoot out. So I was going to change this. And then in weight hang test, it could not be as strong as I wanted it because the fork, you know, it's open. The fork is open at the, at the teeth or the, the tines, whatever you call this, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so they would break and bend uh, under weight hang. So I thought, well, I have to close that. I have to make that thing so it's a uh, structurally more sound by adding a column in front of the fork. So the fork became then a slot. But the slot wouldn't work because to get it in the exact spot where it needs to be over the blade tang, the slot can't clear it when you pull when you pull the lock back. To the, it won't clear the blade tang. So oh, like, oh, oh to, to, to make it tight enough to lock it open without play. Yeah, but when you release it, because you have now you have the material on the fork that matters. Right. There's no material there, but so when you you can't release it, so then I had to make that. If you see the Instagram videos, you'll see that the dip in the front of it where the rock, the the lock goes back and then it lifts up and it, it sits in that depression and that allows it to so it moves back laterally and then it it, it rotates upward and that allows it the, to clear the so there's room for the blade tang to <laughs> then close. If you make that blade tang real small, it won't be strong. There'll be no leverage between the, uh, like, for example, from the center of the pin, the broccoli pivot, you know, the blade pivot pin from the center there out to the, to the part where you're locking, the, where the blade touches the, the lock. The longer that is, the better leverage you have, the more mechanical mm-hmm. advantage you have. So if you simply make that really tiny to clear that locking mem- member, then it's, it's a weak lock. It won't, you lose all your leverage. Leverage is working against you, not with you in this case. So you need to somehow move that lock out of the way without compromising the size and the distance of those levers that, you know, mm-hmm. are created in your blade tank. So that's why I had to make that move backward and then upward to clear the path. And then you'll see the second part. There's a second cavity in the locking member, and it contains a coil spring, a compression spring, actually, that when you pull it back, there's a pin and it, and it compresses against the second slot in the in the locking member and it moves it back and forth it's kind of like a track mm-hmm. so there's a there's a track with a spring in it and then there's the the um the area where the the stop pin of the, not the stop pin but the second pin in the blade handle it wedges and that's your locking mechanism you have created the triad lock the scorpion lock uh, the, the shark lock, the ram, what do, what, what is the one, uh, the ram lock? The ra- ram safe lock. Basically. The ram so safe lock. Yeah. So y- you clearly have made your name innovating on locks. When, when you're, when you came up with the new shark lock, for instance, and I know it's an old concept from 2008 that you had, but when you're creating a new locking mechanism, what are you thinking? Describe what you're thinking. Are you thinking this is going to make, this is going to, this is going to be the strongest one ever, or is it a different kind of thing? Is it, 
this is going to make the user experience better or, you know, what goes into the, what, what's your inspiration for creating new locks? Well, two, there's definitely two things. Firstly, it has to be a, a great lock that the knife has to open smoothly. It has to be easy to unlock and it has to be strong. Not only strong, it has to be durable. I probably said the same thing last time. Mm-hmm. It has to be strong and durable. I cannot stand a knife with a lock that's weak. I mean, don't put a lock, you know, who wants anywhere else in life? Do you want a lock that's weak? Are you going to tie, <laughs> are you going to chain your bike up with a lock that's weak? That just drives me crazy. So, and it's got to be able to, you know, be tough. It's so that's the first thing is it's got to have all, it's got to meet all the criteria of sh- strength. Hopefully, not only sh- important strength, but strength weight ratio is, is, I would say the caveat there because, you know, you can make a lot of, a lot of knives strong. Anything mm-hmm. now, if you make it bigger and thicker, it's probably going to be stronger. So, you know, we can make a frame lock that's, that has a half inch thick frame on per side. And it would be just a brick. It, it might be super strong. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's no good. So you have to have, it has to be strong for its weight. Um, and then for me, primarily when I design new locks, it's because I'm trying to improve from what I think I needed to improve on in the past. Things that, that hurt me in the past when I'm making knives. And, um, I will go on record and saying the tried lock is the hardest lock ever, ever, ever in the world to make. <laughs> and I don't know if I'll make another one. They're so hard to make. So you mean in your so custom hard. shop, they're a pain in the ass. Like now that you've well, passed you, the design on to manufacturing, they can deal with it. But in your shop, you don't. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, well, in production, they're horrible too. I mean, I have, <laughs> I've had years of working with the manufacturers to get them right. So just to, to give you an idea, the tolerance of the triad lock is one half of a thousand. They call that five tenths. So you cut a piece of paper up like a regular piece of printer paper. I don't know. Divide that by eight or 10. That's the, that's the, that's the tolerance. If you miss that, your lock doesn't work. If you hit that, your lock is like Superman. It's like indestructible. But if you miss it, time for making new parts. Go Something ahead. about that triad lock, and I and I think I think you explained this about the scorpion lock as well. But I know about the triad lock. As it wears in over time, it seats itself deeper and deeper. As it gets smoother and smoother, and it wears in more and more, it actually seats itself deeper. Uh, the notch into the or the tab into the notch, whatever it is, on the lock itself making it even stronger. Is that, uh, is that something that you go for when you're designing a, a lock, like say the shark lock, for instance? Absolutely. I, I call that, uh, you know, um, self-adjustment. Self-adjustment. I, that up. I think somebody else made that up, but it's self-adjust. They used to say that if you read manuals or books on, on how to uh, make a liner lock, the liner lock or, or frame lock for that matter should self-adjust, meaning that that lock, leaf or lock bar should touch the touch the blade tang i say all the way on Mm -hmm. you know but but not in the middle and then after a bunch of flicking and a bunch of use you know the the lock is going to be towards the middle of the blade Mm -hmm. then after a lot of abuse it's you know out on the other side so it does have self-adjustment but it's used up way too quickly in a in a liner lock or frame lock for my liking Okay, so so in the uh, how how does it work in the shark lock? I mean, without getting too technical, does it have the same sort of thing? Does it bury itself deeper as it uh, yes. wears in? Yes. Well, it's the same thing, but again, we're 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 going on uh, the what I, I would call it the x-axis, if that makes any sense. You know, that's the that's yeah, yes. the horiz- yeah. the horizon. Right. So it keeps on moving. That's coil spring, and it keeps on pushing it forward, forward, forward. And it has the same features where the, what it is, is there's a, a dish shape in the blade tang. And then there's the, the opposite shape, you know, a hump kind mm-hmm. of in, in the lock. Uh, but those two things, they're not, they're not concentric with each other. Okay. Now, I get I'm not a smart guy, but they're not concentric. So when they move forward, they keep on tightening. Okay. All right. You think because they have room to do so. If they were concentric, yeah, it would be they would be locked in from the it'd start. Be the same, it would be the same the whole way. If they move. They would only move out of. They wouldn't. They would. They would only fit in one spot, 
and then they would get looser as they go. Okay, okay. So let me ask you this: uh, with uh, the the triad lock for me is uh, I'm going to call it field stripping, but of course it's not. It's hanging out in the man cave, uh, opening up knives. Uh, I I have uh, it. It did not take me long to get very used to the triad lock. I have to be honest; I've never disassembled my uh, cold steel eighty fifteen because um, I haven't had the reason or the curiosity. Honestly, how is it field stripping, if you will, the shark lock? Is that something? Is that a whole new learning cl- curve? Do we have to, uh, uh, is it an easy system or? Okay. It is the easiest. It oh. is the easiest. Every aspect of the shark lock, because again, from all my, my heartaches and trials and, <laughs> and issues building shark lo- or scorpion locks and triad locks, do I, in my next knife, my next design, I, I, it, everything that my brother says, this is a pain in the butt, you know, like, <laughs> that's going to change. That's, and this is going to change and that's going to change. So literally you can, now you have to have, you know, a T8 screw, a T8 mm-hmm. Torx or a T10, depending on what screws you would choose in that. You could, you can field strip it. Like, for example, you can buy different scales. I can send you scales and in five minutes or less, you can change out your scales. It's completely made to be a modular system, mm. which is one of the, one of the big things for me because I saw this video of some knives being made and they were all fitted to the, the blade, to the lock or the frame lock blade. Each knife was made individually to the tang of the blade to the, I don't want to mention who it was. I was like, man, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, these things need to go together. They need to go okay, together. Okay. Wait, so. wait, let me, let me stop you right there, Andrew, uh, before you continue with that thought, a lot of people would think, no, that's the height of, um, you know, custom lux. Each one is individual. So why do you think it's ridiculous? Because the design, why can't the design be so good that they just work? They don't need a, a master, master, master to fine tune them, fine tune mm. them, fine tune mm-hmm. them. I want that thing to go together. So, you know, I told you that triad lock had that half of a thousand tolerance and that, yeah. that lock up in the groin. And then the scorpion lock, I eliminated that quite a bit. Uh, it can go, it can go a couple thousand. So it had like four times the, so like it has pens, you know, those pens that go into the, on the scorpion lock. And if that pen comes out, it's three sixteenths, one eight seven five. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you order these dials and you have one eight seven O, if that was a, a, a tri lock, it would not work. That was your tolerance already gone. Right. The scorpion lock can handle a couple thousands either way now the shark lock the way i finally figured to design the receiving members that's what the patent attorney calls them the receiving members are the locking faces uh is that i'm sorry is that on the is that on the tang of the blade you're talking that is the tang yeah where the tang and and the the lock mate interface okay uh, with with those non-concentric shapes they lock up Push it in further, it locks up. Push it in further, it locks up. It moves in further because of where it locks up. It's always wedging and locking up. So now this allows me to, you ruin your blade. You say, hey, I want to say that it's an MG, the machine ground one. Mm-hmm. You ruin your blade. Hey, can I get a new blade? No problem. I'll send you the blade. It'll fit. Nice. You want new new liners, new scales, new, everything I can send to you, that everything fits. So the so the 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 uh, customer who buys an eighty twenty uh, thrashes their blade wants a new blade. You can just send it to them. They don't have to send you the knife and not have it for a few months and all that. Correct. And also, I did wow. this so making I, everyone's life easier. Yes, that's <laughs> my whole goal. Is this thing will be so modular that if you say uh, you're going to buy the, the MG, the the target price on that's four twenty five, which I think is a pretty darn good price. For either 3V or 20CV, hmm. and you have the G10, uh, 316th G10 frame with the steel liners. I use steel because titanium, yes, it's cooler. It's not as strong. I tested, mm-hmm. tested, tested. I'm going with the steel. So um, if you say, yeah, I, I like that Warren Cliff knife you showed me, yeah, but it's a custom blade. I can send you that custom blade. It's going to fit. It's going to function. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mm-hmm. be just as perfectly working as if you bought it from me. So. All of the, those tolerances that you might say, oh, that's that's the beauty of it. It's hand fit, hand fit, hand, 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 hand. All of those issues have been designed out of it, so it's not necessary. Now, don't think though that because that's designed out that this is like a sloppy, like 
Um, in fact, the reason, the real reason why I put this project on hold initially is because the locking, the locking member, the lock, locking bar, whatever you want to call that. That's the part that slides forward and the lock. And yeah. The lock, the, mm -hmm. the lock, very, very, very difficult to make it. So it has to be cut on the wire EDM. So the wire EDM, if you know anything about it, it's wire, it's called wire cutting. Okay, so this it's is the machine that, that 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 cuts out the piece. Yes. Okay. So that machine, the tolerance on that machine is 50 millionths of an inch. <laughs> wow. I don't know what that is, but there's a lot of zeros in front of a five. A yeah. lot, a lot, there's a whole line of zeros. So, I mean, and that, that machine does, it's the most accurate way in the world. No other thing can cut steel or a conductive material more accurately than a wire EDM. Wow. So I have those part. I cut those parts on the wire EDM, the blade tanks and those locking members. And that, that tolerance that is so extreme makes everything else down the line just work. Is that all in your, um, in your design work? Is that all happening on the computer that, that it can come out like that? Or uh, I know it's a lot of back and forth. I bet, you know, uh, trying it out, building it, testing it out in the shop and then going back to the drawing board and such. But um, I mean, what allows for five millionths of uh, a, a, an inch tolerance uh, from the human side? I can understand you can program a wire EDM to do that. But on your end of things, on your design end of things, does that come from a healthy back and forth between actually having prototypes and then going back to the designing board? Or, or is that all pure mathematics? And, you know, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's no math. This, I, you know, there's no, I'm not a math whiz. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, Cause we're, no. I mean, we're talking about numbers. I don't quite understand. And we're also talking about uh, machines and tolerances that are, you know, more precise than my mind can get, I think, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, I can't, I can only measure, measure, you know, one, two, four places. And there's like three or four more zeros. I don't know how many zeros <laughs> past that. But, um, so the key is, and I got turned on to the wire and EDM years ago. We bought one, Cold still bought one for the R&D shop because we had a lot of problems with the triad lock. And mm -hmm. I would make them, we would make fixtures and mill them. And, you know, we're saying that it's that one thing. And then the manufacturer would use a, um, uh, like a CMM, a coordinate machine. And they would, they would take your part okay. and magnify it an amazing amount of times to tell you every angle. And they're like, no, you think it's, Eight degrees, it's eight point zero zero three. And we're like, oh, what the hell? Eight come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we bought the wire EDM because whatever you draw on the computer, you know, on CAD, mm -hmm. I use Inventor, whatever you draw there and you cut it out, that's what it is. There's absolutely no question. It's not like, oh guy, your your angle is a tenth of a something off. No, no. It's perfect, perfect, perfect. And so I got on the, I got into that and then that's how I said, well, I got to get one of these for myself. So then I got the wire and, um, so I draw it on CAD. I know what I want. And then, you know, honestly, sometimes I make 20, 30, 40, 50, who knows? I have boxes of knives that are only now when I changed, changed, so it's like sticking or whatever. I changed one of the measurements. I change a thousand at a time. I don't change, you know, this, everything else is just too small for me. Oh, okay. But, I got you. But if, but if, if, if the thing measures 0 0.001 and it's a little sticky, I make it 0 0.002 or 0, 0, 0, whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I move one thousandth at a time and I, and I, then I test it out. And once you get it, whatever it's, you know, you figure it out, it's, it's perfect. You write it down on the it. wall so you don't forget it. Yeah. You just, <laughs> you, hopefully, hopefully you organize all your programs and get everything out of there. But the thing about the wire EDM is, like everything with the extreme accuracy, it's extremely slow. Uh, so at one time I was sending, I was sending blades out to a, a machine shop and literally for one blade, like, um, I think I was doing the, uh, it was one of the cold steel knives and they charged me to cut one blade, $125. Holy just to, mackerel. That's the, that's the price because it takes about 45 minutes to cut it out or, or longer. It's slow, slow. It's so slow. You, I mean, you paint drying is faster, right? But so, um, but the payoff is you get extreme yes. fidelity. Yes, so, but yeah, you're perfect after that. 
All right. So the 8020, I want to talk about that knife a little bit because I've uh, been looking at it uh, quite a bit. And it's all Andrew Demko. You look at it, it's definitely in your design language, but it also definitely looks uh, very different to me from the 80, 10, and 15. Uh, why don't mm-hmm. you describe to folks uh, what, what, they're, what they're looking at when they see uh, an 80, 20? And, and, you know, we know already that we see the lock uh, coming up out of the spine, and, that, and that's uh, evocative of a shark fin, and that's, that's why you call it the shark lock, which I want to get to your yeah. brother's reaction to at some point. Because I have a brother, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, okay. So, what are people looking at when they see an eighty twenty? Well, probably a knife that looks like, as far as ergonomically speaking, mm-hmm. um, you know, most of my other knives, I, I usually tend to stick to some type of choil. No, you know, choil, a handle choil, where your pinky and your index finger have some place to go, and then usually either a recurve or a swell. That's like. I think that's like the, the, the Ten Commandments in, in three of, of knife handles. And, you know, I, I wish I would have a smaller handle and stuff. Well, oftentimes, you know, people are very critical about handle size. But you can't get the big blade and the small handle. So, <laughs> you know, you know, you, buy a fixed blade, know. man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody is like, oh, that handle, I wish the handle was a little smaller or whatever. And I'm like, well, yeah, but. You can't put a three-inch blade in a two-and-a-half-inch handle. Yeah. And I wish so, you were less dumb. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So, well, I wouldn't say that. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but no, I mean, you just, you know, it's like uh, I try to, you try to, because there's some odd rules in the knife community that people will be like the handle ratio, you know, handle the blade ratio. And I don't f- follow any of those rules. I mean, <laughs> now the, sh- the scorpion lock happened to be great, but it was, wasn't, it wasn't, that was only a consequence of the design. Yeah, because the scorpion lock, um, because some of the tang kind of protrudes past the handle, right? It allows yeah. it allows a larger blade in in that handle. Uh, uh, incidentally, I've noticed that like the blade to handle ratio on this is pleasing. It's an it's a pleasing thing, you know. It's a people like the symmetry of of seeing. Something. Yeah, but but when you think about taking one thing and folding it into another thing, and there's a pivot point. It can only be as, you know, you, you can only go so far without making a, a folding knife that's going to cut you when it's closed. Right. But, you know, and the thing is, when I, when I hear somebody, that if it's a frame lock or something like that, oh, this has great handle ratio, and, you know, and it's not, it's a little less than standard, I think to myself, oh, yeah, it has a really small tang, and it has poor leverage, and it's going to be weak, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I want, I want something that has a bigger handle that I know there's room for, for, for better geometry in the locking lockup of it so and also you want to know that there's room underneath that handle scale to accommodate a uh, a washer of some sort or or yeah you know whatever so uh, yeah. y- uh the 8020 is coming out in an first of all uh, you have an opening slot is that right instead of a, a tang am i remembering that correctly or you instead are, of a thumb you stud are correct well i did both i did okay a, it, they all have well not the MG, the machine ground versions, all mm-hmm. have the thumb stud, and the majority of them have the slot also. Okay. Because I kind of got into um, flicking the knife open. I don't know, like like with your middle like finger, cooler, like the cooler dudes do. <laughs> you know, kind of. I'm, I'm kind of in the young crowd, uh, so <laughs> I like that. But also, what I like about it is, you know, I'm not a knife fighter, and I don't, you know, it's not my thing. I'm not a you know, I am a martial artist, but I'm not like a, I'm not like a knife. I don't, that's like, that's not, out, of, out of my list of a million. That's like almost a million. Okay. You're an Aikido but, man who likes guns. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but what I, what I do like about that slot, other than it's fun to play with and it looks cool is that no matter what crappy emergency that you, or poor condition that you you need to open your knife in and a lot of times poor conditions when your hands are cold kind of numb at least in pennsylvania mm-hmm. and uh you know you just put your you just run your thumb in that way that you have the muscle memory to do so and you'll go your thumb will go in that groove and on that stud and you the knife will open because you have double the chance to make it happen right and that's actually my my main feature about that but i did i realized that some people will feel like hey that makes the blade weak and it does because they're still missing so I also, I, I don't know what you're doing, but you know, hey, if you say I'm going on uh, on a, on a dog sleighing expedition, you know, whatever, and I, you know what I mean, cold weather, uh, I'd say yeah, maybe maybe you don't want your maybe you want to use the uh, non-slotted knife, 
I've had people say that, you know, they're, you wouldn't believe the stories I hear. I, I mean, I, I've I seen mean, they're true. But. Is that really, I mean, okay, you take, you take a slab of, uh, uh, three V or S, uh, or, or 20 CV, uh, with, at whatever width you're running on the, on the 80, 20, and you put that slot in it. Is that, is that actually making it any weaker? I mean, actually well, in reality? Oh, def- yes, definitely. Because really? we're, okay. we're, where's it ground to? Well, See, isn't, isn't, the, isn't the pivot, isn't the pivot going to give way first or the handle or something before uh, that right. slot in the blade is no. going to really? Okay. No, I have, I have a habit of walking around and, and, and lacking saplings <laughs> and branches and stuff with my, I like to carry like a more of a slicer, you know, type of deal. Mm-hmm. And there's been times when I went to close my blade and there was no blade there. It was stuck in the branch. No kidding. Oh okay. yeah. So, okay. because, hey, you can't chop, you can't chop down pinky sized hot dog sticks or thumb sized hot dog sticks on, you know what I mean? Yeah. With a knife that's brown to be only a slicer. So yeah, I mean, you're losing material, you're losing strength. And if you're only taking one knife and you, it's going to be used rough, maybe you want to choose the, you know, the thicker steel, the, the lower grind, that mm-hmm. helps a lot. Sure. So you don't get to grind up through that thumb slot. And then something that's not compromised by having the, uh, because, the thing is, the blade choil, you know, the choil is that little part where you sharpen to, that, that'll run right up, the stress runs right up there because of the plunge and the choil, and then it doesn't, it doesn't need any material. So it's yeah. just hollow back there, and then there goes your blade. So if you're, if you're, if it's not a survival knife issue, you're cool, you know what I mean? I, yeah, yeah. I've carried now for three years the slotted one, and I didn't break it. But, I also didn't swing at any, you know, chopping any branches down with it. Well, I, I have to, uh, I have to admit, you're talking to a somewhat superficial guy. You know, I'm not. Uh, what, what I mean to say is, I'm not using my uh, eighty fifteen or eighty ten for much more than like uh, doing yard work. So I'm not mm-hmm. putting them to the ultimate test. So, so when I when I cast out, it's not it's not in your expertise or in your experience on thrashing on your own blades. It's just I can't imagine these two knives, the eighty ten or fifteen breaking in regular use because they're so damn stout you know oh uh, yeah you're right you're absolutely right especially in 3v so the mg version the first of all they're taper ground or we call it flat ground we call it oh, okay. ground, but usually yeah. i think in america they call it flat ground yeah uh because it's usually it's not really flat ground if it's not top to bottom it's you know what i mean it's yeah a it's a grind. saber grinder yeah so on those MGs, I have the saber grind just under the slot, so there's still full thickness of the blade tang or the blade thickness, blade blade still under that slot, so it's a lot stronger. But on my customs, I like to hollow grind them thinly and up high, so they really, 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 really cut. So you know, I would, I don't, of course, no one should be tall with you know a pocket knife. Yeah, mm. we all know the warnings, but people do. <laughs> yeah. uh, use it, you know, I wouldn't use one of those rough because they're ground really, really thin. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, they go through that slot, but you know uh, you can we can easily grind you a knife as tough as you want it. But bear in mind that the tougher is, the tougher it is, the worse the cuts. So, sure, sure. Know. And and really, <laughs> really, why not just get a uh, Demco fixed blade at that point? Ugh. Yes. So uh, with the uh, eighty twenty, I saw a drop point, a clip point, and a Warncliffe. Is that right? That is correct. The thing is, I like. I like the design and I like, mm-hmm. you know, I like to make blades. So I did the MG version and the clip point because I hadn't done a, a you know, a, a mass quantity of clip points. And, um, but yeah, I did the customs. I did clip point, uh, drop point. I think that's called a Warren Cliff. It's not really a Warren Cliff. So I don't know. I call it a low point. You did sort of a sheep's um, foot kind of thing with a, yeah, with a, a sheep's traded... foot or, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like a modern kind of sheep's foot. Yeah, but yeah, I did. I did that, and um, changing the jimping as well on top. So I put some really great jimping on all those because they're wire cut, so I could really take mm-hmm. advantage of the wire and put some jimping that was um, pretty amazing. Something you're not going to do on the CNC machine, kind, CNC mill. Kind of like the real fine jimping between the large jimps on your custom uh, 80s, uh, 80, 15, yes. and 80, 20. Yeah. I've only seen pictures, but yeah, those those little jimps in between the big jimps look like very fine and grippy. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could use them like a fingernail file. They're really, <laughs> really, really fine. And that's stuff you can do on a wire because that wire is only five thousandths of an inch, 10,000 10, diameter, five thousand radius. So you can really do some some fine work with that. Man, that's just awesome. 
you are one of the uh, one of the top designers in my collection. I have a lot of Emersons and a lot of other knives, but uh, I have a lot of knives that uh, you have designed or um, yeah ha- had a, de- a hand in designing either the lock mm-hmm. or most of them uh, the knives themselves. And recently, I saw your own personal uh, custom broken skull on uh, Instagram. Yes. And we're showing that up. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so, so I, I carry a pink broken skull um, pretty much daily in my waistband, just as my uh, backup sandwich cutter, or if I find myself uh, on the ground getting kicked by a gang, you know, slash some ankles yeah. with it or whatever. So yeah. it's, it's so thin, and it's such a great blade, and I'm a sucker for a clip point blade, but it also... It's just so easy to stash. I tell my brother, I gave my brother one and I said, now you never have an excuse not to have four inches of super steel on you at all times. Razor sharp Bowie blade. And that's what I love about it. And I put one of those, uh, snaggle tooth, uh, uh, openers on it. It's like a wave deployer that you can mm-hmm. put. And, uh, so that's my, uh, that's my go to backup knife, like of all time. I saw your broken skull that you tweaked for your own purposes. And and now I'm thinking of tweaking my own. Tell me about yours. <laughs> okay. So I was I was going on a, on a little, not a major canoe trip. It was like a day canoe trip. And my favorite thing about any vacation or any adventure or anything is what knife am I going to take, you know? <laughs> I think and, everyone listening uh, can relate. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's the best. And um, so I really wanted to, because I was just wearing, you know, like kind of like swim trunks, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry the broken skull. I find the broken skull really hard to get out of my pocket because the clip is tight and it's kind of low, you know, like a low ride knife. So I put a groove in the handle. So when, you know, you have to pinch that between your index finger and your thumb, you know, kind of holding onto the, the pocket screws. Mm-hmm. So I put a groove, yeah. I milled a groove in there that would, you know, my thumb would bite into and it really, really helped. And also I mentioned to you that I like to have in my, every knife I do, like, like when my kids used to draw pictures, like they draw a picture every day, it's all the same. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's the same fish every time. Yeah. So all my knives, they have that p- pinky, uh, a choil. It's just a half of a round circle, you know, mm-hmm. for your, for your pinky and then one for your next finger. So I put that pinky choil in there. And then the only other thing I did is because I'm not a fan particularly mm-hmm. of the clip point that's a recurve, meaning that classic style that the, 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 kinda, the clip itself is is uh, less than straight it has a dip to it yeah the, yeah the recurve clip point and oftentimes i think it's kind of called a california clip but mm-hmm. usually a california clip i think is a is maybe longer you know one at least one third of the blade length like a muskrat anyway, yeah so it was just i kind of like yeah and and i didn't the points are sometimes a little bit flimsier on that because you've removed material from behind that point oh um, yeah that makes yeah. sense Mm-hmm. So yes. I like, but I love a clip point. I love a straight clip point. So then I ground the clip point down straight. That made the point a little more robust, a little stronger. Um, and then just made the knife just, it was just a fun thing to do. <laughs> and I still, I use it still all the time. Well, let me ask you this, uh, cause I, I like to modify some knives. I've modified some, uh, less, less expensive knives because I don't worry too much about them. Um, but I have a, uh, you know, I have a, I have a belt grinder, but it's a 42 by, mm-hmm. by two inch that you get at Sears, you know, so I can't vary the speed of it. So if, if, if people are listening out there, they like to maybe modify their blades a little bit. What should they do if they don't have the super sweet machines and the know how? What should they do to make sure they're not trashing the heat treat on their blade if they want to tweak it? So yeah, definitely on your blades. You can use any grinder, any any anything like that, but you can't overheat that blade. The good thing is that these super steels, you know, if you're working on with like mine was uh, XHP or the, mm-hmm. the uh, 35 BN, those things don't start tempering to well over 500. Sometimes even like I think, I think the XHP was even higher, like 900. Three oh. is like 900. So it takes a while to get there. But if you have like a you know, like a carbon steel, mm-hmm. like 400 degrees, 425, and you're going to start to soften that knife up, really? which is not all that. It, it will go quick. You can get that hot quick. Yeah. So you have to, if it's hotter than you can stand to touch, don't let it get any hotter than that. Quench it in some water. Keep it cool. So and keep a little use, can of water there. Keep dunking it in. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Keep it, keep it cool. And, you know, quite honestly, if you have the patience, you can just set some emery cloth sandpaper down on a flat surface if you're going to, like, flatten your clip out. Mm-hmm. And just use some elbow grease. 
Yeah. That, that would be fine too. I, but I, I would have, like a, a power pool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, before I had that, that grinder, I had done that a number of times with, uh, either, um, you know, taking some of that, uh, wet, dry sandpaper and kind of yeah. wrapping it around a strop and then doing some, you know, you get kind of gets, uh, like I, I, uh, convexed a number of blades that way. And, uh, just, you know, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't, uh, you know, I was watching, uh, Rambo two not too long ago. And there's that scene where they, where the bad Russian, you know, st- sticks his awesome, uh, Lyle knife in the, in the fire and, and then gets it red hot and then cur- burns his face. And, and I, and I know many other knife people groan at that because they're like, that knife is not oh. garbage. <laughs> They every movie, I mean, so many movies they do that with a hatchet or a knife, and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, my wife's like, okay, you know. <laughs> that's that's enough, guy. That's enough. You would never do that, <laughs> you know. So with with the eighty twenty, when when can people uh, start ordering them, buying them? Uh, what's your schedule for production? Well, one of our our dealers is having a virtual knife show. I think it's. It might be this weekend. The uh, Metjoy. Okay. So we are supplying them some knives for that, and uh, we have a handful of dealers to work really well with us. So at the same time, we're going to try to, you know, within a week, we're going to try to get four or five of our different, de- at least four of our different dealers out a handful of customs. These will okay. be customs with the hand ground blades and stuff. Right. Um, but the 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 MG version is out at the grind house. All everything's done in house. We have all everything ready. So within two weeks, hopefully, we should start assembling the MGs, and then we'll 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 be okay. pumping them out. Okay, explain for listeners the difference between uh, the what the MG is as opposed to the other version. Okay, so briefly, if you'll allow me to rant, please. And I may have said this. I may have said this last time. <laughs> I hate the term. Mid tech, <laughs> hate it. With all due respect, I hate that term. Uh, and what happened? And like, oh, is that a mid tech? And a lot of guys, you know, they're doing mid techs where they're doing the work, and then someone else finishes the work or does whatever. And then all of a sudden, guys were having knives made by completely somebody else. And it's like, oh, this is my knife. This is my mid tech. I'm like, well, what the hell? Where? How did you do that? And you know, you. So mid tech. <laughs> yeah, is, is, you've been making yeah. knives for three years. How did you manage to make such a perfect yeah, knife? I, I don't understand how you produce this knife, and you know they're getting they're getting 500 pieces made in, in China and calling it a mid tech, and I'm like, so we call it because we do everything possible in house. Mm-hmm. So um, in in house, and I'm it's really house. It's my garage, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. It's so it, it's a big garage it's downstairs. But, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's literally in house. So you know, I have the surface grinder, the CNC mill, the wire EDM, and um. The only thing that we're not doing, we're not turning our own screws. All right, we're buying screws and parts like that. But the blades, we're cutting out the blades, we're cutting out the lock part, parts, we're machining all the handles, and then we send the blade out to heat treat, and then it goes to a vendor who bevel grinds the blade, or mm-hmm. flat grind, paper grind, whatever, whatever we're doing there. And then it comes back. So if we if we do not send that knife out, and we hand grind the blade. So, you know, I stand behind the grinder, and mm-hmm, rrr, mm-hmm. which I don't like to do anymore. That's kind of old. Yeah. You know, so that's why I don't do too many full customs anymore. So we call and people would, might not agree with me, but they can do their business, you know, however they want. That's, and I, I'm not going to criticize that. Um, unless they call it a mid tech. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so if it's a custom, that means that the blade was ground by me in house. And usually it'll be hollow ground since we do the MG, the machine ground version outside. So I charge a lot more for my time to stand there and hollow grind the knife out, uh, to a beautiful satin finish as compared to the MGs, which just go on the grinding machine mm-hmm. and it takes one pull, bzz, the other yep. side, one pull, bzz, and it's ground and then right. it's tumbled. And so, but I, why do I do that? It's because I don't want to charge $800. I want, I don't want you to buy, hey, I do. There's not everybody can do that. Yeah. I want to get that knife the price down, 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 so everybody yeah. can can get that. So I'm a lot. I'm it able, enables me to get my price way, way, way down because I don't have to suffer behind my belt grinder. So do you? And with, that's how we do that with the machine ground uh, versions of your knives. 
um, I know you're putting the edge, like the machine ground part is, is referring to the bevel being put on the blade, not to yes. the edge, not to the blade finishing, not to anything else, but that, do you put your personal touch on the handles and the anodizing so, and all that stuff? That is absolutely the only difference in the machine ground and the regular custom is that the machine ground is ground on the machine by the okay. vendor. Every other part is the same. Um, is is the regular custom in the it's made in my shop here in Wampum PA. And if I if I take my hand grown blade and put it in there, it becomes the hand ground model. And if I put the MG blade in the machine ground model, and you save a lot of money. And it's it's really a darn good knife. Just as just as good. Right. The the advantage of the the hand the hand ground one is that to the machine ground we do have to do 200 pieces basically the same steel and the same shape mm -hmm. so uh 200 or more whatever minimum 200 and 20 cv with the clip point and then all the other ones i, I like to make guys will say hey i, I, I have to have the warrant left mm -hmm. so and they'll say i have to have it in x hp or i have to have it so then i can and i and i can make that thing and they want it to be Ten thousandths behind the edge before you sharpen whatever, and you know I can I can do that and make you a fantastic, beautifully finished hollow ground knife that is more towards you what you believe is the most ideal steel, the most ideal thickness, the most ideal whatever for you. Right. True. That's custom. when it becomes custom. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, so I, I have a, a couple more questions. Of uh, I want to get to your brother's reaction, but before we get there. Uh, hang weight testing and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, when you, so you've just developed this new, uh, you've developed the shark lock, you've got the patent, you have, uh, you have the other locks, uh, the triad and the, uh, scorpion lock. What importance do you put in the hang weight test and the ultimate, like, amount of weight a knife can, can carry on the lock? Well, that's a really good question because I have a habit of, wanting to be stronger, 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 stronger. But at the same time, you have to remember, wait a minute, you, you, you can't make this thing, you know, too thick, too heavy, too whatever, too whatever. So it has to be, it has to be as strong as it can in, in the constraints of a still really useful knife at a certain weight with a certain amount of material. Um, and then when you get that, you know, you want to make a regular, let's like say a regular, regular four inch knife. It's got to be as strong as it can be after that, you know, but that doesn't mean that we're going to put a blade in that's, you know, ridiculously thick. It'll be really strong if it's a thick blade, but it's like, oh, this is just ridiculous. So right, right. usually once I get the design nailed down how I want it, like I did with the, the 8020, I knew it wasn't changing. It could be, it's strong. It's really strong. It could be even stronger if I made it like the handle taller, you know, and the blade wider, it would get stronger because we would increase those leverages. Length, the distance from the pivot pin, the blade pivot pin to the locking face. Right. So you have to, at least for me, I have to say, wait a minute, this is it. This is the, this is the outline. Now we have to make sure everything's as strong as possible. So that brings me, it's a good point you brought up because, and the customs, for example, the, the locking, the locking bar is made of 17.4 pH, which is extremely, extremely strong for precipitation, precipitation hardening in stainless steel. Mm. Strong, 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 strong. And then the other knives in, in the MG version are 416. And it was 416 is incredibly strong also. Uh, it, tough. I shouldn't say strong. It's incredibly tough as the 17.4. The 17.4, it costs as much as titanium, and it's a nightmare to work with. <laughs> now, the YEDM cuts it out like it doesn't know what it doesn't care because it's the electric, electric spark erosion. But even pre joining it, it's a nightmare because it's already at 32 RC when you get it or 35. It's just like, oh, um, can't even, you couldn't even do it like, uh, in, in, in large, large quantities because you can't even hardly drill it out. Because it's half hardened by the time it gets to you or it, it, well, it is half hardened. To other it's steels. Not, yeah. It's not, that's just, that's just the way it is from the start. It's just, that's as wimpy as it gets. It's 32 <laughs> RC or something like that. So yeah, it's just a nightmare. So, but it's strong. And uh, so I reserve that for the customs. And then um, 416, like, drills like butter. The 416 is what most of the pins are made of. It's, a, you know, it gets to about 52 RC at full hardness. So it's really, really strong. 
So I was making uh, the locking. Oh, it's not really a locking bar. I was making the lock out of 440C. And um, even at 54C, they were kind of brittle. Hmm. So then I experimented with a 416 at 54C, and I did crush tests and stuff. And it was much tougher because it's got less carbon. So that's an example of how in that art, in that design, that wasn't going to change. I experimented with the materials to get a better result in the, in the weight hang test to make it stronger. Okay, so that's kind of your your benchmark, and it's not necessarily you're you're always kind of uh, balancing uh, weight to strength. You know, you, you could make it as strong as you want, but it could be four pounds. So you, you're always right. kind of balancing and being realistic um, with with the the weight ratio and and that kind of and that kind of thing. Because I have uh, cold steel knives; that those are my only uh, uh, exposure to your. Uh, designs. I don't have any of your customs and I trust them like thrashing, uh, as hard as I thrash, uh, out in the yard against, uh, against wood and against, uh, against other things. Like it's a fixed blade. And, and that's really mm-hmm. the confidence I get from that thing. Um, and, uh, you know, whether you're using, uh, 17 4, is that what you called it? Or 4, tw- that's four, right. Or 4 16. And 4 pH. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's the design and it's the innovation that went into it because you, you labor over these lock designs. I remember the last time we spoke on Knife Junkie episode number 20, uh, you talked about how the stuff keeps you up at night. This is your, <laughs> yes. you know, this is your mission. And, uh, yes. uh, I, I think it's really, uh, great. You're, you're also, I, I just quickly before we wrap here, an Aikido guy and you grew up in an Aikido Aikikai, I think. And, yes. uh, when are we going to see another Tanto from you? <laughs> so back to what we originally said is I try to phase out all the things that are a pain in the butt. <laughs> well, grind, grinding the Yakote on that is so painful. But, <laughs> um, yeah, it's those. Sometimes you're feeling like, you know, really, really like, yeah, let's do something crazy. And then I mm-hmm. might grind one. But uh, there's no plans. Like you, That's not something you plan on doing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Something you're not forced to do anyway. or you do by accident. <laughs> Yeah, it's just one day when you're feeling great. And you're like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grind this or whatever. But it's, right. yeah, it's, otherwise it's a chore. All right, Andrew, For I'm gonna, anyway. I, I'm, I'm gonna rib you a little bit. Uh, you said your brother took yeah. exception to the shark lock. Well, what was that about? You know, I, do you know him? I don't know him, but I, I know brothers, <laughs> and so well, I'm interested in I'll, the story. I'll tell you, he's not as charismatic as I am. Okay, <laughs> and he's, I say he's a little bit grumpy. He might not agree with me there. And, uh, you know, it, he's 16 years younger than me. Uh-huh. And, uh, oh. so it's very painful. But we go to shows and people are like, oh, but your son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and the funny thing is, my son is 16 years younger than him. Oh, wow. So then we're, yeah, so we're all three at the show. Although my son now is bigger than both of us. So it's, it's really confusing. And all I know is <laughs> I seem to be the, look and be the <laughs> oldest one. Um, but yeah, he's just like, are you sure you want to call it the shark lock? I don't know. That's kind of dumb. And, you know, but it just, I don't know. It's just, I don't, it feels like, I don't know what I, no matter what I said, it'd be like, ah. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. You I know? get it. I get it. I'm the younger brother. So I get it. You're like, come on, oh, man. You like that. <laughs> well, I understand it. <laughs> I understand it. It's actually a perfect name because it's evocative of what it looks like. You know, there's, uh, when you look yes. at the eighty twenty, there is definitely a, a little fin rising up from the spine, and it looks to be in the perfect spot to be either a a, a, a forward pushing thumb ramp in in saber grip, or sort of that reverse um, uh, thumb ramp. You know, if it's if your thumb is up front a little bit to draw mm-hmm. back to pull back on it uh, in a draw cut, and and I'm a real um, I, I'm a sucker for a thumb ramp. What can I say? Uh, that's a, I guess that's a little bit of a nerdy thing to say, but I look at that knife and, and I'm really excited about it. And, uh, this is probably uh, way premature, but I hope someday it comes out in a cold steel version. But if it doesn't, I hope to someday, uh, possess the AD20 myself, hopefully in a hand ground, <laughs> but if not, definitely in a machine ground. Cause it's a, it's a beautiful looking knife. And I love, I love all the variations with the blades, the, the three different blade shapes I've seen. So, um, great. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm so happy you're able to come on here because to me, you are, um, you are that lock innovator. You're that person who stays up late at night worrying about how our lock, how our knives stay open 
And uh, I I hope I speak for many when, when I say we appreciate you for that. So thank you for well, coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Thank you so much. It's it's really a pleasure to uh, talk to you. It's it's my pleasure too. And do you have any 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 plans? Uh, I know you said your dealer is going to be doing a virtual blade show. Is is there anything else happening uh, for you that people can look for your knives? I have about fifty custom blades that I've been grinding. So <laughs> I'm going to be grinding <laughs> blades as much as possible so I can I can debut this. And I almost held all this back. I didn't want to debut it because of all that was going on with the the virus and people, you know what I mean, and shut down. And and it's, it's not really, a, a financially, it might not be a time to launch a product. But I was like, I, who cares? It's it's awesome and people are going to like it. And whether yeah. they like it and buy it later, you know, whenever, you know, their funds are right and they're back to work or whatever. So yeah. we just went for it. It, it. Two things, it could be the perfect time because uh, some people, some people actually might be in the state of mind to, to, and, and in the, in the financial state to do that. And B, people need to be uplifted with something awesome and new coming out from Andrew Demko. So, I mean, I think, I think the timing is probably just right. Good. Well, I'm glad you support that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I've I convinced really everyone else. <laughs> Andrew yes. Demko, again, thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. All right, we're back on episode number 118 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Bob, uh, great to have Andrew Demko back on the show. Yeah, he's uh, he's a great guy, and uh, man, I just love his knives. I, I realize um, I have so many knives designed by him in my case over there that, uh, you know, this, this is the second time I got to talk to him. It's great to hear about his, his uh, thought process and all of the rigorous tooling and retooling that goes into uh, making these precise very strong locks uh and that's that's really kind of not in in my wheelhouse in terms of temperament so it's always great to talk to uh you know the man who does it himself right and uh this shark lock just uh just had me from the moment i saw it so well it was uh, definitely interesting for me the knife newbie to uh to hear about all the different locks that he has has come up with i mean it was like you know a i didn't know there was that many locks and and b that He's the man behind the, as you said, the triad lock, the scorpion lock, the ram safe lock, and now yeah. the the shark lock. <laughs> yeah, and the shark lock is sort of a uh, a hybrid between the the ram safe and the um, scorpion kind of. And uh, so, th- I mean, the way he described it, it's just another kind of brilliant innovation. Right. And uh, you know, it it always begs the question: Is it needed? Do we need a, yet another way to lock a knife open? And uh, and I say yes. Well, before we wrap up the show, one thing we want to uh, mention, uh, folks may have remembered back in April, uh, you did a epic knife town hall. It was five and a half hours of knife fun, a live yeah. video show on YouTube. 17 guests. Yeah, it's time for another knife town hall. That's right. That's right. Coming up on Saturday, June the 20th at noon Eastern Standard Time, we're going to have a uh, a scaled down version of that, that uh, epic inaugural uh, town hall was to set the tone, but the the town halls from here on out are going to be with fewer guests and longer conversations and more engagement from uh, from listeners. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I should say viewers because it, because it's going to be live on YouTube. Well, and we've got uh, several names that we want to drop, but we're not going to do yeah. it today. And there there's some big names, folks. So you'll definitely want to go ahead and put it on your calendar for Saturday, June 20th at noon Eastern. Uh, like we said, put a tickler in your calendar and don't miss it. Yeah, and and just so we're not mistaken, this is an opportunity to speak with some of our knife heroes, uh, actually face to face. In some cases, you'll be able to jump on with video and uh, and comment. So it's a way to interact directly with some of these uh, amazing knife makers. We'll be uh, talking more about the uh, Knife Town Hall on June 20th coming up on future podcasts as well on thir- as well as Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. every Thursday. So you can uh, watch Bob there and uh, get some uh, ideas of who the guest will be, and we'll talk more about how you can join in all the fun and that kind of good stuff. All right, Bob, final takeaway, final uh, word from the Knife Junkie before we uh, close out episode number 118 of the podcast. Well, this is on a selfish note. Uh, every uh, The two times I've spoken with Andrew Demko and the other times I've seen videos from his shop, I feel like I have to invite myself there sometime and, and just check it out. Check out the tools and watch him and uh, his partner work. 
just looks awesome. Yeah. All right. Great interview. Again, if you want to go back and hear the first interview with Andrew, that's episode 20, theknifejunkie.com slash 20. This is theknifejunkie.com slash 118. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person, saying thanks so much for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.